Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. This is uh, the first time that uh, the Australasian University Safety Association and the National Safety Council um, of Australia Foundation have, have done one of these joint uh, webinars, and uh, we're very excited to be able to do this uh, to bring bring something to to all of our members uh, across Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. Um, and obviously it's, it's really important at this time of the year uh, being National Safe Work Month. So this is uh, one of those activities that we're doing as part of that. Um, I will get started shortly. I'm just waiting for a few more people to, to uh, come on board. Uh, we will be, uh, we are recording this and um, a copy of the presentation will be available on both um, National Safety Council's website and the AUSA website. Oh, I might might make a start. Um, for those who don't know me, um, I'm Stephen Wayne. I'm the, the president of AUSA, and um, hopefully people have a chance to read my bio. Uh, I've been working in safety roles for a number of years and uh, been president of AUSA for uh, almost two years. And I've just been told to speak up a little bit. <laughs> so hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, and I will lean a little bit closer to the microphone. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about three simple safety conversations that every worker should have. And um, this, is, this is the kind of presentation that we really want you to go back and share. If you are a safety professional, to go back and share with, uh, with your workers. Uh, really important that, uh, that everybody understands um, the importance of these conversations. The first one is identifying workplace hazards. Uh, you know, how often do you walk past a hazard or nearly injure yourself and think, oh, someone should fix that. Um, we've all done it at some stage. Uh, you know, it might be that loose bit of carpet that we trip over on our way to the printer, the dodgy PowerPoint that's hanging off the wall, uh, those magpies that swoop us on the way to the cafe, or the leaking tap by the footpath that's starting to uh, cause a bit of a puddle right where everybody walks through. Um, an example even closer to home, uh, my, my wife yesterday came home from work and she'd injured herself. Um, she cut her finger on, a, on the metal door frame. Um, it'd been damaged, so there was a, a sharp edge uh, right where she was turning the key to get through the door. Um, when her managers asked her about what caused the incident, she mentioned that nine months ago, uh, she was told by another worker that the door frame was sharp, but nothing could be done about it. Nobody bothered to report it. Um, you know, yet most workers knew about the hazard and nothing got done. Uh, management have now gone and ensured that the incident's been reported and that the damaged door frame will be filed smooth. So it's, it's those things, those little things that we see all the time, um, you know, somebody should fix that, doesn't, doesn't always fix it. Now, I love this little, um, this little comic here, this little cartoon. Um, you know, it, it really says really well who, who the most likely person is to notice a workplace hazard, and that's the people who work there. And, um, you know, all it takes is for people to open their eyes and have a look around. Um, the reason why workers are the best place to identify those hazards, because they know their workplace better than anyone. Um, you know, that what do they need fixed to work safely? What are the things that make them uncomfortable about their jobs? Is it poorly maintained PPE or is it a chemical that they worry may cause cancer? Uh, it comes down to workers having a look around their workplace and identifying what it is that they think is a hazard that uh, causes them a bit of concern about working with and, uh, and then talking to somebody to make sure that something is done about it. And, and how easy, you know, this is, the, this is the big question now, how easy is it these days to report hazards so that somebody can fix them? Um, you know, it's, it's as simple as a conversation with your supervisor, a phone call to facilities management or the work health and safety team. Um, technology these days made reporting hazards really easy and effective. Uh, you can, you, you know, most people have got a mobile phone, snap a quick photo, uh, attach it to your report, 
uh, your workplace might even have a hazard reporting app or a website that you can use uh, your mobile phone to report it straight away. Uh, we have email, we have SMS, so you can contact facilities management or your work health and safety uh, representative or, or uh, the work health and safety team. So the key thing here is, is you know, remembering not to just complain about it to your co-workers, but to report it to someone who can actually fix it. And, and the, the key here is if, it, if you want to get it fixed, it has to be reported. So the statistics show, and, and for those who are safety professionals, you'll have seen these types of graphs before. Um, you know, if it doesn't get reported, someone will eventually be injured. And we look at the trend in these graphs here, and, and you can see where the, the, the safety reporting culture was quite low in 2015. And so not much was reported, but the number of injuries reported uh, were quite high. And when we look at it, the, the inverse is true as well. So when we have an increase in the number of hazards that are reported, so identifying those things which could cause harm before they actually harm somebody, we see a decrease in the number of injuries. Um, of course, that still relies on uh, the workplace having that good safety culture where, uh, where management will provide the resources to improve, uh, improve those, those hazards identified. And this is one of my favourite things to talk about when it, when it comes to safety conversations, and that's workers sharing ideas to make the workplace safer. Um, I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about this because it's, it really is um, a, a very powerful thing in the workplace. Because they do, workers' safety improvement ideas do have that power to save lives. Um, some examples here. Uh, so we. We can see there's a, uh, a series of bins, dumpsters, and a ramp there. What happened was uh, we had um, in a workplace uh, some workers who regularly manually handled waste. So they were transferring from the, the tray on the back of their truck into the dumpsters. Um, they came up with a really great safety solution. They decided to put this ramp in place, um, which places the, the tray of that truck level with the top of the dumpsters and reducing that manual lifting of heavy and bulky items above head height. Uh, another example, uh, a technical officer in the printmaking department was concerned about the number of hazardous materials being used in their area. They went through their entire chemical inventory, investigated non-hazardous alternatives, so substitution using that hierarchy of controls that we we quite often talk about, um, found alternatives for each of the materials that they used. They replaced all of their solvent-based inks with water-based ones, and this in turn also eliminated the need to clean the items with terps and methylated spirits. So in the end, they were able to reduce the number of hazardous materials and substances from about 30 down to only two, which is absolutely significant reduction in hazard as a result of workers coming up with a safety suggestion, improvement idea uh, in their area. Um, you'll see in the, in the slide here, we've got the pictures of the fans. This is a really simple solution uh, to a, a significant hazard. And for anybody who's worked uh, with these fans, they are very, very heavy. Uh, I, I remember working with them uh, back in my aviation days. Aircraft hangers used to use them to, to try and keep people cool. Um, obviously like a big tin shed. And in this, in, uh, this instance here, this example, um, these fans were being picked up and moved around on a regular basis. So a conversation amongst the staff um, and they came up with a simple solution to, uh, to put, put, in, uh, put in place some wheels. So just some casters on the, on the base of that fan. So basically now, they can just move them around really, really easily. Um, and like I say, anybody who's ever had to uh, move these fans will appreciate what a significant uh, improvement that very simple solution is. Another example, uh, which I heard about recently, um, where a worker had gone on a visit to a boat builder and they saw a trailer there with wire mesh that was installed between the top of the trailer frame and the boat rollers. 
The builder explained that the trailer was destined for northern Australia, where there's a risk of crocodile attack during retrieval of the boat. Um, so the worker realised at that point, well, yes, OK, that's, that's great for when a crocodile might attack, but they could see that it would also prevent their crew from slipping off the thin, wet trailer rails into the water. So now all of their boat trailers have this mesh, uh, and now the crew are able to confidently move across the trailer without risk of slipping between the rails. Uh, the last example I'd like to share in, in, uh, in this slide is uh, recently I was fortunate to go and visit with an organisation uh, where they have an animal house. And uh, they were regularly lifting cages um, from head height, or that is head height for the average height of, of a worker. Um, and they discovered that most of their workers were straining during their lifts. Um, some workers were of a height that they couldn't even reach those top cages. So what they did is they reviewed their practices. Uh, they also recognised during that review, there was a manual handling risk associated with the maintenance of some heavy equipment above the cages. And uh, they suggested a, a very simple and cheap solution, uh, a winch operated lifting device, which is on wheels, so they can move it around from uh, area to area. Um, and it cost them about $500, and that's now in use. So that, that is a, a really clear example of workers who came up with their own solution. These, these weren't safety professionals. These are the workers. They came up with the, these ideas themselves. Now, it's important that we share, uh, we share these ideas. Um, and more importantly than that, these safety suggestions need to come from workers. So, you know, as much as safety professionals try to understand the nature of the work in their organisation or the area that they partner with, um, you know, they're not there on the workshop floor, in the lab or on the site, wherever they might be. Um, workers are there, so they're more likely to identify a safer way of doing their jobs. And in some cases, hey, it might even be an easier way to work. Uh, when I've been called out to assist, to work with a team, um, with a risk assessment or to write a safe work procedure, uh, I always find that the workers provide the best solutions. I might ask some questions, um, you know, ask why they're doing a task a certain way or uh, how a piece of equipment operates, but that then just gets them thinking. Um, it's about, you know, starting that thought process and then they come up with a better and safer way to operate. Now, sharing these safety success stories is the third conversation that we need to always be having. Um, you know, it, it's often understated and underrated. And like the iceberg, you know, there's more to sharing safety wins than what's first seen. Uh, there's always a reason we document our risk assessments and our safe work procedures, and that's so we can share with others how to work more safely in a work environment where efficiencies and times, uh, sorry, time constraint factors are in place, no one's got time to be reinventing that wheel. So we, we wanna share those wins. Um, one of the things we can do is we can look at positive or lead safety key performance indicators instead of those negative or lag indicators. So instead of looking at um, the number of incidents and injuries, we can look at, um, you know, to what, how many toolbox talks are we having? Um, so are safety improvements being discussed? In our WHS committees, our management meetings, are we talking about these safety wins? Are we encouraging um, recognition of, uh, of positive safety wins in our workplaces? We don't need to wait for those injuries to tell us we've got a safety problem before we try and fix it. Um, if we share those safety improvement stories, report on them, um, those are indications of a safety culture that, are, that is very positive and mature in an organisation. A strong, positive safety culture means reduced incidents. Now, the, the other thing that's really, really important about um, our, our safety storytelling is it's powerful not just to the group that's been that's been, you know, had the improvement in place. It's really valuable 
for an entire organization or even for industries. So one of the things that uh, the AUSA is doing at the moment, and uh, I know that uh, a lot of other safety organizations do this, um, we're introducing an awards program. So these are designed to encourage the sharing of safety successes within organizations and then throughout the higher education and research industries in, in our case. Um, this is the really important thing about safety storytelling. It's about making sure that we have the opportunity to help other people. Like I said before, we're very busy people. We work in very, um, very time poor environments in a lot of cases. And it's important that we make sure um, that we help each other out and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Those, those fantastic ideas that, that can benefit entire organisations and industries should be shared uh, so that we can improve uh, the way that we do things. And that really, um, and I know we had an hour allocated, but that really is how simple it is. It's those three simple safety conversations every worker should be having. Now, I'll open up um, opportunity for some questions uh, for a little while, and then, uh, and then we'll finish up. So if you've got any questions, um, if you can pop them down in the questions section, and I'll try and answer them for you. important is it to formally record the hazard in a hazard register if it is immediately controlled when identified and noted? Um, I guess like I've been talking about that you know we, we need to learn from other people's experiences so um, it, it may be that recording those hazards even though you might be addressing them immediately and um, controlling them immediately the other people in the organisation should have access to uh, those hazard registers and that information should be shared. So I, I think it's quite important that we do uh, record those. But don't obviously go over the top. It's, it's really important in safety that we don't uh, overdo things, that we don't put in too much red tape and too much extra work uh, and extra processes. Another question's come through. Uh, what are some simple steps to make people feel safe to raise safety concerns? And that's a fantastic question. Um, obviously, we do have a, a, a number of a number of people who, um, in our workplaces, feel like either they can't report something, uh, or it, it may be the um, I guess there may be a, a culture in the workplace that prevents them from from feeling safe to report uh, any concerns. And, and to be honest, uh, I've worked in environments like that. Uh, most of us probably have. So some simple steps uh, that I'm aware of to help make people feel safe, to raise their safety concerns, um, you can make it anonymous. Uh, you know, it's, it's a really, that's a really simple way of doing things. Um, a lot of online reporting tools have uh, an anonymous portal so that people don't have to sign in. Um, and you can make it that people don't have to put what their name is. As long as you get enough information to be able to action that, um, it's really important. Some other things that you can do is reward people for putting their safety suggestions forward. Have, you know, have your leadership of your organisation uh, recognise those good safety suggestions and, uh, and safety concerns being raised. Uh, when, when workers can see that their input is being recognised, um, and you know, valued, then they're going to feel safe to to uh, raise those concerns. This is great, getting lots of lots of questions. Um, someone's asked if, if I can restate the, the the headings of the three simple safety conversations. So the first one is identifying hazards. Uh, the second one is. Um, talking about safety suggestions, safety improvements, and the third one is uh, sharing those safety success stories.
Another question, similar to previous question, um, trust is required to encourage reporting and sharing of stories. So it needs to expand into building a positive safety culture. Um, this is chicken and egg question. Which one comes first? Does it matter? Um, I guess it's going to be different for each organisation. You know, if you've got if you've got the kind of safety culture where uh, where you where you can encourage um, sharing of, of safety suggestions, safety concerns, um, you know. Yeah, that is, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't think it really does matter um, as long as you're getting people talking. And I think from, from my experience, it'll all depend on your your senior executive in your organisation. If, <clears throat> if you can get your senior executive on board, then Get them to lead it. Get them to encourage it. Um, <clears throat> but it's yeah, it, it is a very fine line. Um, building a safety culture is something that takes time. Um, being able to uh, encourage positive reporting uh, is something that really needs to be approached from um, multiple angles. Uh, an example: um, in one of my previous workplaces, I had a colleague who. Um, who worked on exactly this issue, trying to improve reporting. They had a significant under-reporting issue and uh, and it was a cultural issue. They knew that people were afraid, <coughs> excuse me, that they were afraid that if they reported um, a safety issue that, you know, they would be, um, you know, frowned upon, that uh, you know, it would have a negative impact on, on their work. And so, what they did is they built a very simple reporting tool. Um, they used some technology that they had already in the workplace and they um, promoted it um, at multiple levels and uh, got management on board as well, talked to all the managers and supervisors and built it from there. Um, they then ended up being an area in the organisation that had the highest number of uh, hazards and incidents reported. So you can see in that example, how people can um, change a safety culture. And, and that one actually only happened over the course of about three months. So that was a fairly quick one. Um, but again, uh, it all depends on the organisation. Um, another question, what do you think about running online surveys to encourage others to report concerns? I guess, again, this comes down to culture and, and that's a, a huge thing in in safety is, is the culture um, and the maturity of your safety culture in your organisation. Uh, with surveys, it's really important that those surveys are made very, very clear that they are anonymous um, unless you want them to be uh, identified. I guess the trouble is we have, have a lot of workers in a lot of workplaces who feel like every every survey that we put out, if it's done on a computer, that um, that it is being tracked. So it's a very difficult one to do, but obviously it's a very powerful tool if you've got the kind of workplace culture that will uh, allow that to be effective. Um, next question is, what is the best approach to getting senior management on board? Well, isn't that the golden question? <laughs> and I'm sure that we all, um, at some stage in our careers, have, have struggled with that. Um, it will depend entirely on um, the senior management. Um, sometimes, sometimes you'll need to bring in the right specialist, um, you know, a consultant. Uh, I know that, that we've recently brought in uh, into into the organisation where I work, uh, we brought in consultants who uh, gave a presentation to our, um, our senior leadership and our um, and our management board. And what what we did there is we just we we decided that it would be that they would respect the views of 
uh, of an external professional uh, more than they would of an internal staff member. So while that while that makes it very difficult for building a relationship between yourself as a safety professional and your senior executive or your management in your organisation, um, what it does do is it, it teaches them. Um, another thing that I've seen and heard done is having a mock court. Um, and those are really, you know, it's the shock value. Um, but again, it depends on, you, you know, you have to go, go with your gut. Basically, identify whether the organisation that you're working in um, is, at a, is at a point where you need to use an educative approach or a shock approach. Um, there are some organisations where the senior management involvement is so poor um, that the only way that, that you can get them on board uh, is, is to basically shock them, explain to them what could happen uh, as a result of them not showing due diligence, uh, of them not providing the resources that they need as officers of the organisation. And I think that's the key uh, when we talk about management involvement is making sure they understand what their role is as an officer uh, under WHS or OHS legislation, depending on which, which state or territory you're in. Um, I find this one very challenging, but very rewarding. Uh, I've, I've worked with a number of, of senior management across a number of organisations over the years and really got a lot of, um, a lot of pleasure out of working with them and seeing them grow. Um, I'm very much of an educative approach, but I have at times had to had to pull out the, the, the big stick and say, well, legislation says if we don't do this this way, this is what uh, what might happen. Okay, any other questions? I think I've managed to cover all of those questions. Um, and really, really grateful for everybody's uh, time coming in, listening, and uh, for your questions. Um, got one last question. Uh, hi, Stephen. That's a good chart illustrating the point that as hazard reporting increases, injury occurrences reduce. Does that come out of some research that can be cited given the audience of in universities is often scientists? Um, what I did there is I've just used some generic data, unidentified data. Um, I've seen those, those graphs I have seen in a number of workplaces. Um, what I can do, um, and I do, I recognise the name of the, the person asking that question, is uh, is I can find some information online uh, that very specifically speaks to that. A uh, classic example is the aviation industry. Um, they have a really strong, uh, really strong reporting culture, and obviously, for those who know me, I do have a background in uh, defence aviation, and so I've seen. Uh, first hand where a, a positive reporting culture has reduced uh, the number of incidents significantly. So what I'll do is um, for that person who's asked that question, I will have a look and I'll find some definitive evidence um, and, uh, and I'll email that to you. Uh, thank you everybody for your questions. I think we, we might wrap it up there and um, we will make these uh, this presentation available on the National Safety Council and AUSA websites. Thank you very much.